Back pain, one of the principal causes of limited activity, lost work time, doctor's visits, hospitalizations, and surgery. Back injury comes in a number of forms, such as spondylolysis and disc herniation, as we've already discussed. In many instances, however, pain results from the strain put on soft tissue structures, such as the intrinsic back muscles we are about to discuss. Welcome back to the second and final session on the muscles of the back. In the previous session, we discussed the extrinsic muscles responsible for movement of the upper limb. We now turn our attention to the intrinsic muscles of the back. Remember, these are the muscles that both originate and insert on the vertebral column and then the ribs, which is what they specifically act upon. Generally speaking, these muscles have a fairly unique design, whereas most muscles are composed of long, continuous muscle fibers that expand from origin to insertion, the intrinsic muscles tend to be discontinuous, with a series of shorter muscle fibers spanning a few spinal segments grouped together to form a unified muscle belly. As a result, many of these muscles can be subdivided into thoracis, cervicis, and capitis segments, depending on the specific attachment point on the thorax, neck, or head regions, respectively. In general, however, the fibers from each region blend in and are difficult to differentiate from one another. Similar to the first session, our objectives for the second session will be identification of the intrinsic back muscles and proficiency in describing their attachments, neurovascular supply, and actions. We'll also be paying specific attention to a reason known as the suboccipital triangle and the neurovascular structures we find there. We'll continue with our exploration of the surface anatomy of the back and incorporate a few more clinical conditions in as well. Let's start by looking at the individual intrinsic muscles of the back in detail. The first intrinsic back muscle we will identify is splenius. The name is of Latin origin, meaning bandage, due to the fact that this rather broad muscle covers over a large number of smaller, deeper muscles in the cervical region. Splenius originates off the nuchal ligament and spinous processes C7 through T3, or 4. The superficial capitis fibers insert on the mastoid process and superior nuchal line of the skull. The deeper cervices fibers insert on the transverse processes of C1 through C4. As is typical of intrinsic back muscles, innervation is supplied by segmental dorsal rami off the cervical and upper thoracic spinal nerves. As with most intrinsic back muscles, these muscles contract bilaterally to extend the cervical vertebrae. Selective unilateral contraction results in ipsilateral rotation and lateral flexion. The largest of the intrinsic back muscles are the erector spinae muscle group. It's actually a collection of three separate muscles with a common origin off the lower lumbar and sacral spinous processes, posterior iliac crest and sacrum. As the muscles project superiorly, however, three distinct muscle bellies can be identified at a gross anatomical level. Iliocostalis is the most lateral of the group. As its name implies, it originates off the iliac crest and inserts primarily on the ribs, although the most superior cervices division inserts on the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae. Longissimus is the intermediate of these three muscles. It gets its name from being the longest muscle in the body, although with discontinuous muscle fibers. The thoracic division inserts on the ribs and thoracic transverse processes, the cervical division attaches to the cervical transverse processes, and a capitis division attaches to the mastoid process of the skull. Spinalis is the medial most of the three muscles. It both originates and inserts on spinous vertebral processes with the uppermost capitis fibers attaching to the base of the skull. Again, they receive their neurovascular supply segmentally through dorsal branches. Despite the three divisions, the muscles work synchronously together. They serve as the chief extensor of the vertebral column when they contract bilaterally. Unilaterally, contraction produces ipsilateral flexion of the trunk. Deep to the erector spinae group are the transversospinalis muscles. The name comes from the fact that these muscles originated off the transverse processes and project superiorly and medially to attach to the spinous processes. Again, three separate bellies can be identified lying superficial to deep. 
Semispinalis is the most superficial of this group. Its fibers typically span five or six segments before inserting, with the prominent capitis portion attaching between the superior and inferior nuchal lines at the base of the skull. The semispinalis does not extend the entire length of the vertebral column. The fibers reach only as far as the lower thoracic and upper lumbar region. Multifidus is the second of the transversal spinalis muscles. Fibers tend to span two to four spinal segments. Multifidus is thick and prominent in the sacral region, but quickly thins and disappears to the lower thoracic region. In the space where there is overlap, semispinalis lies superior to the multifidus muscle. Rotatories is the deepest of the transversal spinalis group. At each vertebral segment, there is a brevis portion spanning only a single segment and a longest portion spanning two vertebral segments. The transversal spinalis muscles work collectively to assist with trunk extension. Unilateral contraction of one side of the body contralaterally rotates the upper trunk to the opposite side. The concept of impsilateral and contralateral rotation may seem daunting at first, but a few minutes in the lab with an articulated skeleton will help you to clear this away in your mind. The rotatories, in particular, are thought to have a role in proprioceptive feedback, similar to the serratus posterior muscle group. In addition to the muscles we've already discussed, a few other minor muscle groups have been identified lying between spinous and transverse processes and attached to the ribs. These are the exceptionally small muscles typically found embedded within interspinous and intertransverse ligaments, and are not anything we'll be spending time searching for during dissection, even though they look prominent in these images. To complete the picture, I wanted to make you aware of their existence. Again, these muscles probably pay more of a role in proprioception as compared to generating actual movement. Although we discuss the individual and specific functions of each of the intrinsic muscles of the back, the reality is that all these muscles work together in a complex synergy to produce the complex movements of the trunk. Dysfunction in any of these muscles will result in generalized deficits with movements of the trunk. A well-trained orthopedic specialist in any of the health professions, however, should be able to perform specific tests to best isolate the precise cause of the dysfunction in order to generate an accurate diagnosis and prescribe recommended treatment goals. The muscles of the lower back are a particular concern in the field of orthopedic medicine. As stated at the onset, lower back pain is incredibly common with more than 3 million new cases per year in the U.S. alone. It shouldn't seem surprising to learn that pain may result from injuries to the vertebral column previously discussed, such as spondylolisthesis or intervertebral disc rupture. What might be surprising to learn, though, is the source of this pain. In these instances of column instability, pain is commonly the result of muscle guarding. Reflexive spasm of the intrinsic muscles is the body's attempt to actively splint around the area of damage. Other times the pain is the result of direct trauma to the muscles themselves, as low back muscles are susceptible to overstretching and tearing, a condition known as muscle strain or muscle pull. Acute strains typically occur with a combination of trunk extension and rotation, often when the individual is carrying a load out in front. The field of ergonomics involves assessment of work and living spaces for at-risk populations and education of proper lifting techniques to avoid injury. Similar education can assist in the prevention of chronic strain resulting from habitually poor posture. This is an important field of preventative medicine to avoid musculoskeletal injuries before they can occur. We've already discussed the dorsal nerve branches in relation to the intrinsic muscles they innervate. Conceptually, ventral and dorsal rootlets off the spinal cord, which will be discussed in the next lecture, merge to form the spinal nerve proper. After exiting the intervertebral foramen, the spinal nerves split into two primary branches. The ventral primary rami supplies muscles of the anterolateral thorax and appendices. The much smaller dorsal primary rami project posteriorly. Here, they give off the motor branches to the intrinsic back muscles we've been discussing, but they also provide cutaneous branches that pass through the muscles to supply the skin. These branches can be observed upon gross dissection, projecting through the superficial muscle group. The dorsal rami from C4 through T6 emerges close to the midline, just lateral to the vertebral column. 
dorsal rami from T7 through T12 emerge more laterally, typically between the border between the latissimus dorsi muscle and the thoracolumbar fascia. Sensory branches from L1 through L3, collectively known as the clunial nerves, emerge lateral to latissimus dorsi and project into the gluteal region. Pain or numbness in these regions of the skin can provide information on nerve impingement and the vertebral levels involved. An understanding of basic surface anatomy along the back is important in clinical practice. While dissection in the present class allows for an unparalleled in-depth view of the body, when you're working with living patients in clinical assessments, their skin and superficial anatomy cover what you are trying to assess most of the time. Some of the muscles we discussed are readily observable in lean muscular individuals, and practice at finding these landmarks will help in individuals with greater quantities of subcutaneous fat. Bilateral comparison of these different muscle groups can help in identifying imbalances indicative of muscle wasting in conjunction with joint tissues or nerve damage. The border of these muscles also tends to create characteristic landmarks. The posterior or median longitudinal furrow, for example, lies between the medial borders of the trapezius muscles over the spinous processes and can assist in the diagnosis of scoliosis. A portion of the lateral border of trapezius contributes to the so-called triangle of oscillation, along with the medial border of the scapula and the superior border of latissimus dorsi. This defines a thin region of the thoracic wall with minimal muscle overlap, which is ideal for stethoscope placement for characterization of breath sounds. Another triangle is formed by the lateral border of latissimus dorsi, the superior border of the iliac crest, and the border of the external oblique, which we have yet to discuss. This is known as the lumbar triangle and is an infrequent site of herniation. Other landmarks include bony protuberances. The vertebral prominence mentioned in the previous class marks the spinous process for C7, allowing a starting reference point from which to count individual vertebrae. Above this point, the spinous processes become hidden superficially within the nuchal groove. The lumbar dimples mark the site for the posterior superior iliac spines. Combined with the intergluteal cleft, these landmarks form the sacral triangle, which is important for landmarking the sacral hiatus. We conclude this lesson with a discussion of the suboccipital region. This is located quite deep to the other muscles we've been discussing so far. It's composed of a series of small muscles in the triangular region they define, which serves as a landmark for a number of important neurovascular structures. Two of these muscles are referred to as the rectus capitis posterior muscles, which include the rectus capitis posterior minor and the rectus capitis posterior major. The minor lies quite deep in the region, originating off the posterior tubercle of C1 and inserting on the inferior nuchal line. The rectus capitis posterior major originates off the spinous processes of C2 and inserts just lateral to the minor. Both of these muscles aid in the extension of the occiput on C1. Lateral to the rectus capitis muscles are the obliquus capitis muscles. The name obliquus capitis inferior is something of a misnomer, seeing as the muscle does not attach to the occiput at all. It originates off the spinous processes of C2 and runs obliquely to insert on the transverse process of C1. Contraction of this muscle rotates the atlas on the axis. Obliquus capitis superior originates from the transverse process of C1 to once again insert between the superior and inferior nuchal lines. Its specific function is unclear, as the fiber orientation suggests rotation of the occiput on C1, a movement that does not generally occur between these joints. It possibly plays a role in proprioception, a function that all the suboccipital muscles may share. Three of these muscles, the rectus capitis major and both obliques, define a region known as the suboccipital triangle. The posterior arch of C1 can be found deep in this region, as well as a couple of neurovascular structures. The vertebral artery lies between the occiput and the posterior arch of C1 as it courses towards the brainstem. The suboccipital nerve emerges from the triangle and, not surprisingly, innervates all four of the suboccipital muscles. 
Although not directly related to the triangle, the greater occipital nerve emerges from inferior to the inferior oblique and courses superiorly above the triangle to receive cutaneous sensation from the back of the head. Likely as a result of their deep location relative to the base of the skull, the suboccipital muscles play a role in certain headache syndromes. Occipital neuralgia results from tension and tightness within the suboccipital muscles and a resulting compression of the occipital nerves. The symptoms are similar to and therefore often confused with migraine headache. In the case of occipital neuralgia, however, a defining characteristic is radiating pain that starts at the base of the skull and runs up the back of the scalp, the direct result of compression of the greater occipital nerve. Part of the treatment of occipital neuralgia involves occipital release, which combines massage and muscle stretch to relax the suboccipital muscles and relieve pressure. We finish with one final note on the vertebral artery. You'll see more regarding the course of this vessel in the head and neck unit. However, it's important to take note of two 90-degree turns that this artery takes along its course. First, as it emerges through the foramen transversarium of C1 to run medially, and the second as it reaches the foramen magnum of the skull to run superiorly. This is of clinical significance in that excessive cervical rotation, especially at the atlanto-occipital joint, can damage the internal lining of the artery, a condition known as vertebral artery dissection. The resulting compromise in blood flow may result in neurological deficits or possibly even stroke. Great care must be taken by rehab therapists performing neck mobilizations and manipulations to not torque on the occiput relative to C1 for fear of causing vertebral artery dissection. This brings us to the end of the lesson. Next time, we will once again be diving into the vertebral canal, this time to look at the spinal cord, spinal nerves, and the protective coverings and vascular supply. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.